I'm here with Dr. Nathan Clough of Arms and Armor, and today we're looking at how swords are made. Cool. Well, thank you. So here are a bunch of our finished products, which are orders that people have put in that we've uh, completed. This is our German branch sword, which is a replica of one that's in the Royal Armories in Leeds. And it's a fine example of a Type 15 longsword. So today I'm going to take us through how we at Arms and Armor make swords, how it differs and how it's the same uh, to the ways they did it in the past and why we have right, those differences. So I'm excited. Tuned. Back in the day, right? If you were making a sword in the medieval period or a knife or whatever, you had a chunk of metal. And you know, this is a way more cohesive chunk of metal than you would have had. You'd have, you know, just a, an ingot, and you'd have to make that long and skinny. And you'd do that by forging it out, right? So you'd put it in the forge, you'd heat it up red hot, and then you'd hammer it out until it was long and skinny. The classic scene at the, the forge. Classic scene, exactly. Yeah. And that's a totally good way to do it, right? Uh, today, we're really lucky that the steel mill takes giant pieces of steel and it rolls them out thin. Much right? easier. Yeah, right. It, they're doing the same thing. Is this more consistent? This is more consistent. It has fewer you know, shunts and breaks in it. It's much more hom homogenous. And it takes out about 80% of that back-breaking work, right? The rollers do it really well. So it makes big sheets of steel. And then we buy sheets of steel and we use a water cutter to cut out the basic shape of the sword, right? So that we avoid that 80% of the just hammering work on there. The next thing that we do is we grind in the distal taper. And this is what they would have done medievally too. They used grinding stones. Our grinding stones are just, you know, sandpaper belts that have an electric motor instead of a couple guys spinning <laughs> a wheel, right? Yeah. And so we grind them by hand, grind in the distal taper, which distal taper is the, uh, how we describe the way that it gets thinner as it gets to the point, which is what is the difference between a sword and a sword-shaped object, <laughs> right? That it actually <laughs> works and moves. So we do all that uh, by hand, and the process there is really similar to the, the medieval way of doing things. Just with power tools. Just with power tools, right? <laughs> Work smarter, not harder. Exactly. If you want one forged out by hand, we can, and we forge things when that's the easiest way to make a product, or if someone really wants it. But honestly, it's not better, and it's five times more expensive. That's fair, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we have a long sword blade that's had some basic grinding work on it. You can see here that it's got a center ridge, right? It's ready to be taken down, but it's really thick and heavy, right? This weighs twice as much as it's going to at the end, right? So to make it into an actual sword means removing a whole bunch of material. So Patrick here is going to show you some grinding, how it's done. Now, each sword blade takes a couple hours, at least, of grinding work at various grits to get it so that it's really sword-shaped and behaves like a sword before we do heat treatment on it. So this steel, if you bent it right now, it would just stay bent. It's not hardened. We try to do most of the grinding like this first. So I'm going to turn it on. You can see the process. So what he's done here, right, he's establishing this bevel. So this sword has a diamond-shaped cross-section. He's establishing that center line and the thickness of the edge. He's going to take that down to about a millimeter and a half. 
super consistently and keep these facets nice and flat so that the sword has a consistent appearance and so that it tapers consistently from the thickest section up here down to the point. So here's a sword blade that has been fully ground, but it hasn't been heat treated yet, right? So that means that this blade, if I bent it, would stay bent. I'm not gonna do that because we already have hours of work into that, but here is a crummy dagger blade that got messed up. We use them to train on, right? If I bend it, it stays bent, right? So David, you, this one has been heat treated, so it's been hardened and tempered, and it's a spring, I can right? flex it, it goes back to it, its original shape. Exactly, which is super important for a sword, yes. because you're gonna be fighting with these, right? So, you know, early in the medieval period, in the Viking period, when they didn't have good steel, and they really, it was pretty much magic, hardening these things. There were recipes that were, they were doing stuff consistently, but they didn't know how, right? A lot of swords were pretty soft. And we have records of, you know, kings talking about how a sword that you could bend that would spring back was worth more than gold, right? It was a super highly desirable thing. And today, you know, science, we're very good at it. But this is the very next step. And from here, this sword is really close to the weight and the dynamics is going to be in the end, but it'll be polished up and made a little thinner. So this is a German hunting knife that I'm about to heat treat. It's called a burnware. It's kind of like a messer, a uh, little bit later. And this is made of 6150 carbon steel, which is what we make our swords out of. And I'm gonna harden it here. So this is our gas forge. It's up to 1,682 degrees right now. And what I'm gonna do is put this in, heat it up to a critical temperature, and then we'll quench it in oil. So I'm gonna open this up and put it in. All right, so this has been in there about seven or eight minutes, maybe 10 minutes. It's up to 1,650 degrees. So I'm gonna pull this and quench it in canola oil, which is going to harden this blade. You can see that it is extremely hot. I'm gonna leave this in there until it's hard enough that it doesn't catch back on fire or cool enough. And so by quickly quenching like this, you're essentially freezing a new crystalline structure into the steel that makes it hard. There we go. So I'll set this up here. You can take a look. And so you can see down here, this is still hundreds of degrees, but down here where that carbon is flaking off, that's one of the indications that you've got a good hardening on there. Now this is probably very hard right now. If I dropped it on the floor, it would probably break. It's really hard, but it's brittle. So we're gonna do another process called tempering here in a few minutes, which is going to let that new crystalline structure relax a little bit, and it's gonna become a spring instead of, previously it was malleable. You could just bend it and it would stay bent. Right now it's really hard, but brittle. And after we temper it, it'll be a spring and it'll bounce back to shape. So we just waited about 45 minutes for the temperature of the forge. I turned it off and it's come down to 550 degrees, a little less. So now we can start tempering the blade. So I just stuck it in here. And what we're gonna do is use this fire brick to block it so that it cools off really slowly. I'm gonna let this cool down until tomorrow morning, right? And what this is gonna do is it's gonna give it that spring temper. It's gonna take the brittleness out of the knife and make it into a tool that you can really use. This kind of pyrometer is super useful. Back in the day, they would have just used their vision 
and the temperature of the steel when they're trying to figure out if it was hot enough to harden. Uh, it's all, actually, it's really interesting. That's why blacksmith forges are usually really dark. You have to be able to see into the fire to see how hot uh, your steel is so you don't just burn it up and melt it uh, so you can get in there. Um, yeah, you can see the temperature's slowly going down and that'll give it a nice spring temper. So when we cast pommels and cross guards, a bunch of the time we've taken molds from original pieces, right? So a bunch of them are from the Wallace collection uh, in London. Others are from the Oakshot Institute collection where we've taken a silicone mold and actually lifted <laughs> the original piece. And then we make an aluminum or latex mold. This is a pommel and we do wax injection and end up with something like this, right? This little lion is from our Medici falchion. Once we have this in wax, we take it to a foundry. Um, if it's bronze, we'll pour it here, but steel is very energy intensive and dangerous <laughs> to pour yourself. And we take it to the foundry and we mount these pieces onto what's called a tree a wax tree. So we'd have several of these on here. And then at the foundry, they'll take this whole tree, they dip it in a ceramic slurry, and then fire it. And this causes the wax to melt out. So it's called lost wax casting. And it hardens that slurry. Right? So then you have a negative of this pommel, every place that we had one. Then they take that they put it in a barrel of sand and they pour molten steel into it. And we end up with <laughs> this in steel. And then we can cut the pommels off right here, drill them, and then do all of the finishing work that's involved, which is a lot. And it's one of the things that gives our sword such an organic quality. Right? Because we're not taking a lathe and turning a perfectly round pommel on it. Instead, we're either taking it from an original piece or we're carving this first, hand carving it out of a piece of wood to make the original, making a mold of it, and then casting it. Right? So that means there are all kinds of asymm asymmetries in it. Every one, they're actually a handmade piece. Uh, this just allows us to make the same sword several times. So when we make rapiers, we start out with a piece that we cast, right? So we cast these in mild steel using a lost wax casting technique to give us the basic form. Then we build out the entire hilt, right? So you can see on this one, the original cast piece is this arm, the quillin arm, and the block. And then the rings and the sweeps I've formed just with a torch to heat them and shape them, and then doing file work. So you can see this detail work here. There are canthus leaves that are being filed into it as decoration. An interesting thing about this is Right here, there's a weld where this bar is welded on to the cross, which is what they would have done in period as well, and it's turned this weld into a decoration, right? Into an acanthus leaf decoration. And they used welds as places to put decoration on original pieces, right? So there are these swells where they'd wrap around the piece of steel, hammer it out square, weld it together, then that's a place where they'd add decorative uh, work. So this one is going to be our Milanese rapier, which is an Italian piece, you'd put your finger through here, and it's a highly ornate 16th century, late 16th century rapier. 
All right, David, so this is a nearly finished sword. The only thing this one needs is leather on the grip yeah. and it needs to be peened, which is a way of essentially riveting the end to hold it all together. And we just have it held together with threads right now. So this sword blade has been ground and finished and sharpened. Uh, the cross here has been fitted to the blade. The pommel has been drilled and fitted to the tang, which goes all the way through. And uh, this is called our Fornovo sword. So it's an early 15th century Italian arming sword. How's it feel? Really nice. <laughs> the balance on this is great. So one of the cool things about this sword is the grip's only three inches long. Yeah. Right? Nice which, sized. yeah. And people are like, oh, they had little hands then. But no, not really, mostly. The pommel is part of the way you control the sword, right? So if you wanna yeah. hold it, you can feel it gives you yeah, leverage. Yeah, another bit of lever there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which is very common for a sword that was used without armor. Oh, so this is a Bloss sword. Yeah, yep, it's a, this is probably a civilian weapon. Okay, that's really cool. Yeah, if you had big metal gauntlets, they wouldn't, wouldn't fit. fit in there, no, no, no. right? But without that, yeah, it's extremely mobile. Now this one, I have it set up so we can take it apart. Uh, and show you uh, how it's made. So, take off this nut. Uh, thank you. So, this is the pommel. Right? This shape here is where your, your hand really fits in. You can see that it's drilled through and it's asymmetrical so that it fits onto the tang. We've threaded the end of the tang here. The grip is a piece of ash wood and we've actually shaped it so it fits exactly onto the tang, which you can see there. Nice. And this is one of the ways they would do it. You heat up the tang. So first you get it to fit pretty close. Then you heat up the tang pretty hot and you can burn it on there. Um, one of the things that does is it anneals the tang. It makes it softer in a really gradual way, which allows you to act to peen it. Right, so if your whole tang is as hard as the sword blade, they wouldn't have been able to peen it very readily in period. And then the cross guard here, and get it off, and see that the blade seats into the cross guard. And the whole thing yeah. is just pressure fitted. Now, another interesting thing, if you just hold the sword blade, right, a well-designed and a good sword, when you hold just the blade, it should still feel like a sword. Yeah, it feels like a sword. It's a little bit heavier than it was before. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Which is funny, because it's so much lighter, yeah. right? Yeah. It just doesn't have that counterbalance. But a blade that's too heavy, you know, people are always talking about pommels as a counterbalance. Yeah. If you have a really heavy blade, you're just gonna have to put heavier and heavier pommels on there until it balances, and it's not gonna work no, <laughs> as a sword, no. right? And it's gonna be a big lump. Exactly, it's yeah. gonna be a giant lump. And so these get put together, they get compressed, and we peen them, and then we call that closing the sword, right? At that point, you don't wanna take it apart. Again, it's a big process, you have to grind off the peen. But they did that a lot in period, too. Did so, they? yeah, like if you were in a sword fight, and your blade got notched up, they'd grind the peen off, pull it apart, repair the blade, or sometimes fashion just changed, right? And so you'd want a different- Cross guard? A different cross guard or something on there. They'd grind that peen off, take it apart, put a new, uh, a new hilt on it. Would they have enough material to paint it again or would they have to do something extra? So what they do is they draw out the tang a little bit so they heat it up and forge it a little bit longer. So there's a, a limited number of times you could really do that without changing the way the sword worked. Okay, that's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> so here you can hold this one and this sword isn't fully put together yet. That's good, but that's why there's a little knot on the end of it. It's just so light. <laughs> yeah, so this is our Black Prince sword. And this kind of, I love this piece because it really gets into what we decide to make, right? There's all kinds of swords you could make, but we try and focus on existing historical pieces. So this sword uh, probably belonged to Edward of Woodstock, okay. who was uh, the Prince of England. They called him the Black Prince. So he invaded France repeatedly in the Hundred Years' War and his arms earned the cross. 
So it's a sword that our friend Ewart Oakshot collected, and then we got to handle the original piece. And when you talk to Chris, he'll tell you about that experience. So since we actually got to handle the original, measure the original, we can make it as close as possible to that sword from 1370. That's really cool. As we can. And so people are always like, oh, can you make this Witcher sword? And we're like, well. We could. We could, but number one, I respect their copyright. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, what we can do is choose an actually historical sword that's similar to it and make it for you so if you decide you don't like The Witcher anymore and you still like the 1370s, <laughs> right, <laughs> you'll be happy with it. Yes. And so, yeah, this is a Type 15 long sword, and Edward was a famous warrior, and he <laughs> just slew the heck out of the French, the Spanish, other English occasionally, <laughs> everybody. He's a super famous warrior who fought in armor, and this sword is just perfect for that. It's beautiful. Thank you. So this is our Italian three ring rapier. It's one that I recently finished. And this is one of the things we do that not many makers do because the only way to build a good rapier hilt is just to completely hand build it. And uh, we make them to the same specs as the originals. So most modern rapiers are way oversized for big Hema gloves and stuff. Yes. Which is cool, that's fine. It's we not what yeah, we do. We kind of need it. Right, but, not yeah. what we do. So we yeah. make them historical. Uh, one of the cool things about this one yes. is the swells. Oh, wow, right? yeah. So all of the subtle that. details. Let me show the camera yeah. really quick. And the asymmetries on it. it. Swells here, and then, yes. Right, and so things like ones that are and I say designed by engineers, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? They tend to be perfectly circular, perfectly circular. If you look at this, right, this isn't a perfect circle. No, it's not. It's biased towards biased the back. Biased towards the back side. Because that's where your hand is. So it's protecting my hand better. Exactly, so it's built around the shape of your of, hand. Yes, right? Which I is love the that. way all the originals were. And it's finished on the inside and the out, right? So if you yes. look at it, most of the time, if you have a rapier, it lives on your hip yep. instead of in someone else's gullet. Yeah. And so you want the underside of it to be to just be as beautiful as the outside of it. But yeah, this is a, a nice piece, sharp rapier. Very well balanced. Does it feel oh, good? It feels really nice. <laughs> <laughs> it just totally wants to stab it some does. English or French or something. <laughs> right? And so yeah, you can see these, all the various branchings in here. Just yeah. do it by hand. And wow. That's the fun way. But yeah, these things are super fun. Take a look at our whole catalog. They're all, they're <laughs> Take all a look awesome. At some fun. <laughs> so yeah, that's the shop. It's really cool. Uh, thank you. And uh, yeah, if you like mm -hmm. any of this stuff, uh, Arms and Armor is online. You can find mm -hmm. him, just Google it. Uh, mm -hmm. They've got their catalog. Also, there's other places to carry your products as well, I know. Yep, Cult of so, Athena carries Cult of Athena some of our carries stuff. quite mm -hmm. a few of your things. Yep, so. I think they're the only wholesaler that we sell to. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you can find their stuff at a lot of different places, but thank you so much for showing us how we make a sword. Oh, absolutely, David. Thank you for yeah. coming down. No problem.